Hokshi. Recorded live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our first broadcast under the name of Hour of the Truth. This is a new broadcast that we have started here on TalkShoe. Today is the very first broadcast, so you are living up to see a premiere. In this case, just right for today. I have two guests with me that I would uh, warmly welcome in a few minutes. But first, I want to give you a little introduction what the show Hour of the Truth is all about. You probably know me as Jörg Glissmann from uh, the YouTube channel Juggler66 and have maybe listened to some of the broadcasts I did earlier on another platform with a, uh, with a friend of mine who is not here today and who probably will not be here in future broadcasts also from the name Nothing But The Truth. Now I've made my own broadcast, changed the name to Hour of the Truth, and that's what you're listening today from. You can always contact me and find me on the Internet. Uh, just Google Joggler66, J-O-G-G-L-E-R-66. And um, then you will come to my YouTube channel. I have about 350 videos uploaded there for the moment right now. And when you go through all the videos, you will see the changes that these videos have made in the span of almost four years that I'm busy with that right now, or almost five years, I don't know, I don't remember exactly. And you will um, see the, um, the way that I have uh, taken all the time from Truta or from somebody who was actually was quite kind of asleep to somebody who became kind of a Truta and then in the way of the journey made his way and found to Jesus Christ and became a follower of Jesus Christ. That is maybe a good moment to, for, uh, to introduce to you the motto, the motto of our show, Hour of the Truth. And that motto is, Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and sent out their crusades. Times and methods may have changed. The goal, however, still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible-believing people who uphold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. And that is also the reason why we do these broadcasts, not only this one, the first of many to follow, I hope, but all the others also, to get the true word of God out. Vital in this, and this is something that you will probably encounter in almost every of our broadcasts, is the real understanding of Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks prophecy, and especially of Daniel's 70th week. We counter the Jesuit Vatican invented futurism, which led to a system that we all live in today. Many people do not understand. They are always chasing ghosts. They are chasing the Jews. They are chasing the bankers. They are chasing Monsanto or things like this, and they do not see what's behind that. And in videos I've done already and that you can find on my channel under the name of Nothing But The Truth, we did a lot of broadcasts on these subjects, and I really advise you to go there and watch these. But last year in July, <clears throat> I made a video and um, that video was called, or is called still, One World Religion. Luther's protest is over? Question mark. And I did that video in that time because there came a video out from Kenneth Copeland, from Kenneth Copeland Ministries, where he had a gathering with a few thousands of his, uh, how do you call that, his priests or whatever you want to call this, people in his organization, together with um, Tony Palmer, one of the bishops in his churches. And they even interviewed the Pope during that because this um, Tony Palmer is even a personal friend of the current Pope, uh, Pope Francis, Mario Borgoglio from Argentina. And um, that video struck me as a thunderstruck. I was thunderstruck when I, when I watched that video. Luther's protest is over, really. What was Luther's protest all about? And we will go into a little bit um, that I mentioned in that video, a little bit of the things that Tony Palmer said there, because that all leads us up to why we are here today. Uh, because today we are doing a broadcast on the Catholic Lutheran Accord. 
that actually is a denial of the gospel and the righteousness of Christ. And we will take that as a basis for our broadcast today. And that is actually a paper written by, uh, written by Richard Bennett. So the kudos go to him for making this paper. We will read the paper and we will analyze the paper and we will discuss the paper. And who is we? First of all, I have to thank Walt Stickel from the website Grand Design Exposed. He is the one who set this talk show call up. He is the one who set the site up and also the site Hour of the Truth on Grand Design Exposed that you will be linked on when you want to listen to these further and where you can also get written links, documents, probably video links and everything will be established there in a few time. But Walt, uh, my brother over there in the United States of America, because I'm here over in Europe and Belgium, um, did all that work and set that up so that we today could have our first broadcast. And I also want to welcome Walt very warmly to this broadcast. Hello, Walt. Uh, th thanks, York. And I'm looking forward to the, to the broadcast today in the uh, and I have to agree with the motto that Rome never changes. And thanks for inviting me. You're very welcome. And my second guest I'm very proud to have here today. He has done so much on the Internet the last 15 to 20 years. <clears throat> he has been a radio uh, host or radio broadcast um, uh, guest on ham radio, on First Amendment radio, he has done a lot of book readings, and the first time that I really got to know him was when he read on Inquisition Update the book Romanism and the Reformation from Henry Gretton Guinness that was written in 1887. And that is actually not a book, but a collection of different lectures that Henry Gretton Guinness did at that time before a live audience. And then afterwards, he put these lectures all together and put them into a book. Um, Inquisition Update is uh, the website where Tom Fress comes from, and I very warmly welcome my brother in Christ, Tom Fress. Hello, Tom. How are you? Hello, Yerk, and nice to be with you. Thank you very much for the invitation, and especially for the material that you have uh, thought so important to share with your listeners. The Catholic Lutheran Accord and it has to do with the ecumenical movement and the initial... Uh, union between the Lutheran churches and the Roman Catholic Church. Remember, the Protestant Reformation uh, began when Martin Luther protested the papacy and uh, the false doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. Martin Luther was really the man who kicked off the Protestant Reformation. Uh, Protestant protest against the Roman Catholic Church existed all throughout history, but Martin Luther led uh, an exodus out of the Roman Catholic Church in, 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 uh, in, in, uh, in uh, obedience to the command of Christ. Come out of her, my people. And uh, that's Revelation chapter 18, verse 4 and 5. And he denounced the papacy as Antichrist, as the Antichrist, and he also condemned the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church that salvation is through the priests or through the Pope or through the Roman Catholic Church and through the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. He literally defined the Roman Catholic Church as the synagogue of Satan, and that it is. Now today, 500 years later, the Lutherans are seeking uh, accord with the Roman Catholic Church, and to try to undo the Reformation, treating it as though it were some kind of a mere misunderstanding, when in fact, the doctrinal differences between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism are irreconcilable. Irreconcilable, and not only that, the Roman Catholic Church is irreformable. And this ecumenical movement to unite the Lutherans and other Protestant denominations back under the authority of the papacy and common communion is blasphemy against the throne of Almighty God. And I am so happy that you've asked me to come and participate on your inaugural broadcast. Thanks, Jerk. Yeah, Tom. 
this really goes back a long time, not only to the Reformation, but of course the Reformation was really a starting point over there, and as you quite well said, Luther was the one who really, I, I always say, took the Reformation into another gear, because we had, of course, reformists like Tyndale and Wycliffe and Cranmer and Huss, and there are too many uh, to name them all, because uh, when you leave one out, you probably don't uh, do them right. So we just say, uh, think of all the Protestant reformers that have been out there and that have been fighting the Roman Catholic system at that time. Something about the name reformers, of course, is something that strikes anybody who is a Bible-believing Christian and who knows that the Roman Catholic Church and all their affiliates are the synagogue of Satan. How can you reform the synagogue of Satan? You actually can't. But you can come out of her, as Revelation 18 verse 4 says, and as Tom so rightfully uh, quoted, you can come out of her and by that teach other people that the Roman Catholic Church is not the true Church of Jesus Christ. The true church of Jesus Christ have always been the Bible-believing Christians, the ones that have been persecuted by the Roman Empire, first the pagan Roman Empire, and after the fall of the Roman pagan Empire in 538 by the Holy Roman Empire, the papal Roman Empire. The Caesars at that time were the letting that prevented the Antichrist to come, and Christians at that time, real Bible-believing Christians, knew that. They even went so far, they fought wars for the Caesars, to keep the Caesars, who even persecuted them, to keep them in power, because they knew when the Caesar was gone, Antichrist was rising up. The little horn of Daniel's prophecy that came up. The little horn also to me a wonderful explanation why the fourth beast from the four beasts of the revelation of Daniel is different from all the other beasts. It's just one horn. It is different from all the empires, all the kingdoms before it. Babylon, Medo-Persia <coughs> and Greece and pagan Rome. It is different because it merges church and state, the little horn. And the little derivation of that we find when we go to Revelation 13, where it states that the first beast that comes out of the sea, and those are multitudes of nations and tongues and people, and the second beast comes out of the earth, and that is an unpopulated area. And that was second beast had two lamb, two horns like a lamb, and the two horns symbolize the splitting of the civil and the spiritual power. And that is also infested in the United States of America Constitution. Congress shall make no law on religion. But today, many people don't even know that. That is past tense, because in today's time, when you go over to the United States of America and you go to whatever Protestant or whatever congregation you think you're going, if it's Protestant or whatever you think it is, and you check them out, you will probably find that they are a 501c3 organization. And 501c3 tax exempt organization means that they are actually a government agency. And that is the melting of church and state. And another point that we will be making on some of the broadcasts here in the future will be the Pope's visit. Borgoglio comes, Pope Francis I comes this year, September 2015, to the United States of America to speak in front of a joint session of Congress on behalf of the American people. There we will see Bible prophecy being fulfilled right before our eyes. Because, in my opinion, that is the moment when, as in Revelation 13, it states, and the Lamb speaks as a dragon. When you invite the dragon from the first beast over to the second beast, and he speaks 
to a joint session of Congress on behalf of the American people that at the latest is the point when a man speaks as a dragon. Tom, do you want to fill into something that I've said here? Because otherwise I'm just going on. Oh, keep going. You're doing a fine job. Taking the words right out of my own mouth. Well, just incredible. <laughs> your comprehension of this, your comprehension of this is very good in my view. Thanks. Okay. So the idea to this broadcast came to me, as I told you, when I made the video uh, that was uh, uploaded on the 2nd of July, 2014, One World Religion, Luther's protest is over. I will now go through a little bit of uh, of the video. Namely, I will tell you and read it to you what Tony Palmer said on this meeting with Kenneth Copeland Ministries. <clears throat> it's about 17 minutes far into the video, and by the way, when you watch my video, One World Religion, Luther's Protest is Over, question mark, in the description box you will find all the links to all the other videos, I mean, to even more information on that, and of course to the video of Kenneth Copeland. By the way, Kenneth Copeland has, in the meantime, uh, forbidden to make, co- uh, to make comments on his video, because I commented on his video, and I called him out as the snake that he is. And a few weeks later, comments were, comments were disabled. So, you won't see my comment anymore, of course. Anyway, Tony Palmer, at about 17 minutes in the original Kenneth Copeland video, says the following, quote, Luther said, we are saved by grace through faith alone. But that's not it. The Catholic Church believed that we are saved by works, and that was the protest. That was the protest. The two churches put the two definitions together. Listen to it. I am reading verbatim from the Catholic Vatican website. Justification means that Christ himself is our righteousness, in which we share through the Holy Spirit in accord with the will of the Father. Together, we Catholics and Protestants, Lutherans, believe and confess that by grace alone, in faith in Christ's saving works, and not because on any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit, who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to good works. Now follows quite a long applause in the video. He continues. This brought an end to the protest of Luther, Brothers and sisters, Luther's protest is over. Is yours? In 1999, this was signed by the Lutheran Church, the Federation Worldwide. Later, five years later, the Worldwide Methodist signed the same agreement. But as of today, we still have no Protestant evangelical that would stand up and sign this agreement to agree with our brothers and sisters that we are saved by grace, through faith, to good works. And I believe that is something that needs to be fixed. There's a challenge for you. So, the protest has been over for 15 years. And I get a little bit cheeky here, because I challenge my Protestant pastor friends. If there's no protest, how can there be a Protestant church? Maybe now we are all Catholics again. But we are Reformed. We are all Reformed. We are Catholics in a universal sense. We are not protesting the doctrine of salvation of the Catholic Church anymore. We now preach the same gospel. We now preach we are saved by grace through faith alone. The word alone was the argument for 500 years. The word alone is there. The protest is over. The protest is over. End quote. I added to this, so, the protest was on the word alone. Well, think for yourselves how you are being deceived here. And for the rest, you can, of course, watch my video. 
and I will link to that. That is one of the biggest deception I have ever heard. I mean, when you go into the reformist, uh, the reforming history, you start 31st of October in 1517, when Martin Luther nailed his 95 Thesis at the church door at Wittenberg in what today is uh, the Federal Republic of Germany, somewhere in the east over there. <clears throat> he was taught to a council in Worms where he was asked to recount and he said that whether, uh, unless that he is proven by the scripture and the scripture alone that anything that he said was not true he stands there and cannot recount anything so help him God a few years later we had the Concile of Spire in 1526 for the first time and as I mentioned in one of my other videos, so you have to go there and see that, uh, in the Council of 1529 in Spire, um, the word Protestant was for the first time formed. And if you want to go into that information, I have a video on it and the links, of course, provided in the video. So you look it up for yourself. So there was a protest going on in the, at that time Holy Roman Empire, Holy Roman Empire of German nation. Um, and this protest started out as being quite fatal for the Roman Catholic Church because a lot of kings and princes and counts and lords turned away from the Roman Catholic Church, gave their people the possibility of freedom of religion to read and study the Bible for their own in their own language for the first time because Luther translated the Bible at the Wartburg in the year 1520 and 1522 if I'm not mistaken and he translated it to German <clears throat> and you also have of course English Bibles at the same time that were translated so the Roman Catholic Church had to do something about that. And what she did was about that, she called for a council, the so-called Council of Trent in 1545, that took 18 years for the Roman Catholic Church to go. It took until 1563. And this Council of Trent was led by a new order that was just called into living in 1540, by a pope, and that order was called the Society of Jesus, or better known today as the Jesuits. And they led the Council of Trent from the beginning until the end. And we made a very interesting broadcast at the time of Nothing But the Truth, and I uploaded the video in the meantime already, why didn't the reformers go all the way, the Sabbath question. And I really advise you to watch that video to understand a lot of um, the Council of Trent, because there was a certain Bishop of Reggio who exposed the Protestant Reformation as what it seemed for the Roman Catholic Church at that moment to be, namely, quite not completely righteous. And we will go into that later on, of course, because the Protestants said, Sola Scriptura, Sola Fide, Sola Gracia, meaning the Scripture and the Scripture alone, and we are saved by grace through faith alone, by the grace of God through faith alone. And we only take the Scripture, the Bible, the Holy Word of God, as our sole foundation for the truth. And the Bishop of Reggio had quite a moment when he, of course, stated, well, what about Sunday, the Holy Sunday, or what about the Sabbath? And that's why you should watch that video. I don't go too far into this because that <laughs> took us at that time already in uh, more than two hour long broadcast, and uh, that would be too much for today. But it's just giving you an idea that when you start digging into this rabbit hole, 
how deep you must go to really understand the things. You really have to go very, very deep. So now you understand after me reading this little quote that Tony Palmer uh, made in a speech in the video of Kenneth Copeland, when he said <coughs> that uh, the Lutheran Church sold, uh, sold, uh, sold out of the Antichrist in 1599, he said Luther's protest is over because that was in, uh, in 1999. This was signed by the Lutheran Church, a federation worldwide. That is the reason why I go, or why we go today into this Lutheran Accord, explain to you what it is all about, and most important of all, explain to you what it shamefully is not all about. And that is the identification of the Roman, of the Holy Roman Papal System as the Biblical, Historical, and Prophetic Antichrist. And there is no way in this world of this um, Catholic Lutheran Accord that this is stipulated anywhere. And to me, and I know also to Tom, this is the most important part of the protest. When you call yourself a Protestant, wherever you are in this world, did you ever ask yourself, what am I protesting? When you are in the Lutheran Church and you agree with the Lutheran Catholic Lutheran Accord that we are going to discuss today, then there is no need for you not to step over to the Roman Catholic Church, because then your belief is the same. But if you agree with what every reformer and what the prophets Paul and John identified as the Antichrist, when you agree with the Bible at who is the son of perdition, who is the little horn of Daniel, who is the biblical and prophetic and historical Antichrist, then you should certainly come out of the Lutheran Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, all of these churches. And seek fellowship with like-minded people who take, like we on this broadcast here all together, the 1611 King James Bible as the only in the English language preserved word of God as their basis. Find a little fellowship there, meet with them there, and according to Jesus, wherever two or three of you are gathered together, in their midst I will be. Praise the Lord. That is true church. That is true religion. That is true Bible, Jesus, following belief. Anything else is heresy. Tom, would you like to say something? Well, it was just a blessing to listen to you say that. We need to come out of all of these churches. Catholic, Lutheran, Methodist, Baptist, and unite as one people under Christ. And uh, look, Rome has deceived the whole world. And because of this deceit, Protestants are now no longer protesting. What were they protesting? First of all, they understood from the prophecies of Daniel's little horn, Paul and John, the revelator, were describing the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of the Bible. They're all one and the same thing. It's the papacy. <clears throat> and the Protestant reformers and all the true Bible believers, even before them, all the way back to the apostolic church, were absolutely convinced by Scripture 
that the papacy, who replaced the Caesars of the pagan Roman Empire, literally was the Antichrist of the Bible. And they were firm on that foundation. They protested the Antichrist church. They protested the papacy. And for one to call oneself a Protestant and yet seek reform of the Roman Catholic Church or seek to ecumenically reunite with the Roman Catholic Church has literally renounced not only their Protestantism, but Christianity altogether. Now, the very foundation of the Protestant Reformation was built upon the fact that the papacy is the Antichrist, the Roman Catholic Church is that scarlet harlot who rides the the scarlet-colored beast of Revelation chapter 17. And initially, they called it the Protestant Reform. They were attempted to reform that church. But after reading the Bible and coming to a full understanding of what the Scripture was really revealing about the Roman Catholic Church, they understood that it was going to exist as it is until Christ returns. And so therefore they had to concede that there is no reforming the Roman Catholic Church. And so literally what took place at the time of the Protestant Reformation was the Gentile equivalent of the deliverance of the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage. Pharaoh, being the pope of his day, was commanded to let the people go so that they they, they could worship God, their creator. And he wouldn't let them go. Well, finally, God delivered him with his own hand. And we all know the story. But what about the Gentiles? For us, Christians were under the iron heel of the man of sin in Rome, the papacy. And because of the the translation of the scriptures into the languages of the people so they, they could read it for the first time in their life, they came to the same conclusion as I have today, the papacy, the papacy is the Antichrist, the modern-day Pharaoh. And God literally, through the Protestant Reformation, delivered his people, his Bible-believing Gentile people, out from under the rulership of the, modern, the modern-day Pharaoh, the papacy, and the Roman Catholic Church, to worship God according to the written word of God. And just like Pharaoh before him, the papacy has gone on relentless war against the Protestant reformers. And that war was declared by the Council of Trent, the Jesuit-led Council of Trent. It was an open declaration of war, a war of annihilation against Protestantism. There's no restraint, and there's no recantation of the Council of Trent. Rome will continue as it is until Christ return, and her her intent and purpose since the Council of Trent is to absolutely annihilate Protestantism and everything that has has arisen from the Protestant Reformation. That's the very purpose for the creation of the Jesuit order. Who called that council into being is to destroy Protestantism at any cost. And let me tell you, history proves that they've been very, very effective in their destruction of Protestantism because now today we have those who call themselves Protestantism, uh, Protestants, are seeking ecumenical dialogue with the Roman Catholic Church. And if Martin Luther could see what, what's happening today, he, it would just, you know, I, I've often said I don't want it to become cliche or anything, but I, I often say that Martin Luther, and I will include the rest of the Protestant reformers, the, the ones that you started to name but are too numerous to mention, all of them, if they could see what Protestants are doing today in this ecumenical movement, they would not just turn in their graves. They would come out and stone us all to death 
Now, that sounds like strong speech. Oh, Tom, aren't you going overboard? Look what God did when the Israelites were delivered by a miraculous right hand of God Almighty, walked through the Red Sea on dry foot, and were given the law on Mount, on Mount Sinai and saw the glory of Almighty God at the top of that mountain. As close as they could get, they still could not comprehend his glory. And then to protest and turn around and wish they could go back to Egypt? The Bible says the ground literally opened up and swallowed 29,000 of them. What? sense does it make for a Protestant who's been delivered by God Almighty out of the Roman Catholic Church, out of the synagogue of Satan, and out of the iron grip of the Roman Catholic Pharaoh, the Pope of Rome, to now clamor for a reunion with that beast? It makes absolutely no sense worse than that. It is a repudiation of Protestantism and a repudiation of Christ himself and the deliverance that he gave us at the Protestant Reformation. It spits in the face of every drop of Protestant blood that has been shed by the Roman Catholic Church for the last 500 years. It's a, it's a spit in the face of every martyr of Jesus all the way back to the first century church. It is the greatest apostasy, the greatest betrayal of Christ one can even imagine. This ecumenical movement is straight from the pits of hell. I want you to know, I want the listeners to know that at the Council of Trent, when the Roman Catholic Church, led by the Jesuit order, the order of, of, of military priests, to annihilate Protestantism and everything that arose out of the Protestant Reformation, that Council of Trent, answering to Martin Luther's 95 theses, answered with 100 anathemas and damnations against every tenet of Protestantism. Denounced them all, all the doctrines of Protestantism, which are biblical doctrines, announced that they were heretics. And they damned them. 100 times, there are 100 separate and specific damnations against the Protestant doctrines. And we could read them. I mean, they're, they're still extant. And Rome, the Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church, still holds that the Council of Trent is the law of the Roman Catholic Church. And in that, just give me a few examples. If you still believe that grace is by faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, and the Word of God alone, you are a heretic. You are anathema to the Roman Catholic Church. Now, Rome has never repudiated, I'm I'm restating this, Rome has never repudiated the Council of Trent this open declaration of war against Protestantism. Rome still mentions the Council of Trent in all of her dealings with the modern-day Protestants and the, and the evangelicals. It's a threat. Every time they mention it, it is a threat to their existence if they do not come back to the Roman Catholic Church. And that's what this Catholic Lutheran Accord is all about. It tries to establish a common ground for the return of Lutherans and all Protestants back to the Roman Catholic Church. And it uses the Council of Trent as a a warning if they refuse. I want the listeners to understand the context of what we're discussing. And we're going to get into some of the details about this Catholic Lutheran accord where somehow they've struck an understanding where there is no understanding at all. And I want you to remember when we read this document, 
and we refer to its terms, the Vatican uses common terms used by Protestants but have an entirely different definition. And each time those terms are used, we'll try to make sure the listeners understand what Roman Catholicism's definition of those terms are. Now, I'll just start by one. When the Roman Catholic Church says Lutherans now agree with the Roman Catholic Church that we are saved by grace through faith alone and that we, uh, in Christ alone, and that we're saved unto good works, which every Protestant can believe with, believe, agree with, what is defined by the Roman Catholic Church as good works are the sacraments. Confessing your sins to a priest. Participating in the, in the crucifixion of Christ at the Mass. Worship of Mary. And all of these things against which Luther protested in the first place. The, the, the analogy is made, can a, can a leopard change its spots? No. And neither can the Roman Catholic Church change its doctrines. Neither can the Roman Catholic Church repudiate the Council of Trent. It is Protestants who must capitulate. It is Protestants who must change. It is Protestants who must lay down the Bible, lay down Christ, and lay down their, their deliverance and become once again enslaved by the modern-day Pharaoh. Yerk, I'll speak for myself, but I'm not going. I've been delivered by a divine hand, and I'm going to follow Christ wherever he leads. And this ecumenical movement will be denounced and repudiated by me and anybody else who can comprehend the truth of history, the truth of the Bible, and the truth of prophecy. And this article by Richard Bennett, The Catholic Lutheran Accord, A Denial of the Gospel and the Righteousness of Christ, is sorely needed information for true Bible-believing Christians today, and I applaud Richard Bennett for having the courage. Richard Bennett, a one-time priest of the Roman Catholic Church, a one-time instructor in the, in, the, in, the, in the college at Rome, gloriously saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ alone. He read the scriptures, and he, as well, just like the Protestant reformers before him, realized who the Antichrist is, who the little horn is, who the man of sin is, who the son of perdition is, who the Antichrist is, it's the papacy. And he's dedicated his life to educating God's people about the Roman Catholic Church and warning God's people, don't touch this ecumenical movement with a 10-foot pole, to put it in colloquial terms. And while most of what is believed to be Protestantism is lunging headlong back into Egypt, back into Pharaoh's bondage to be slaves to a man and repudiating the liberty wherewith Christ has made him free, I'm not going. Not even if it kills me. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. And um, I just want to make two points here before we go into the reading of the document from Richard Bennett. One of the points you have already uh, very nicely explained that was, of course, the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent started the Counter-Reformation. First you had the Reformation, and then you had, of course, the Roman Catholic Counter-Reformation. Initiated, as Tom very well explained, by the, in 1540, new formed Jesuit order. And that was, <clears throat> you know, when you have an enemy, you have two ways to defeat your enemy. One way is that you can struggle in down in war. And if you can't do that, embrace your enemy. And that is what the Vatican Council II 
from 1962 to 1965 was all about. They saw that everything they have done in the time between the Council of Trent, 1563 it ended, until 1962, Vatican II started, that's almost that's 400 years in between, they could not get rid of the Bible in the world, they could not get rid of Protestants in the world, so they had to be found another way. And that was the founding of ecumenism. So if you can't defeat your enemy, embrace him. Well said. And, and do as if you are speaking with his words. And remember that in September 2015, when the Pope comes over to your country, when you use the words and the phrases of your enemy to lure him into deceit. That is what the Roman Catholic Church all is about. The ecumenical movement that started in the late 60s that is now being almost rounded up because one of the results of that Vatican II was the Catholic Lutheran Accord that we are speaking about today. If there was no Vatican II where the Church, the Roman Catholic Church, so-called, opened their arms to the apostates, daughters of the Roman Catholic Church, because all of the Protestant churches are derivatives coming out of the Roman Catholic Church, starting their own Protestant way. So that Protestant has to be taken away. And therefore, this Catholic Lutheran court stands in every word that is written in it. That's one point that I want to make. And the other point that I want to make is, I have here an article from the Jerusalem Post that was posted on the 9th of November, 2014. And the <clears throat> headline reads, Pope Francis wants, quote, lukewarm Christians, unquote. The Lord will vomit you from his mouth. I will read this article to you, and then I will, Tom, give a chance to at least go five minutes over this, because I think that he will be thunderstruck when I read this. So not only Tom, everyone else, listen. Pope Francis warned there are too many people who live their lives as Christians in name only, and that such quote-unquote false Christians are merely pagans and quote-unquote enemies of the cross. During the morning mass at Casa Santa Marta in Vatican City on Friday, the pontiff went on to cite Revelation 3, verse 16, against mediocre believers, declaring that, quote, because you are lukewarm Christians, I vomit you from my mouth, unquote. According to Francis, there are only two types of Christians, those who advance the faith and those who behave as enemies of Christ. These, quote-unquote, enemies are, quote, pagans with two strokes of Christian paint in order to appear as Christians, unquote. He said true believers must be careful not to fall into the trap of paganism. Believers must check in on their intentions and make sure that they are not too focused on material concerns. Asking oneself questions such as, quote, do I like to brag? Do I like money? Do I like my pride? My arrogance? Where are my roots? And where is my citizenship? In heaven or on earth? Unquote. Can be helpful according to the Pope. It is often difficult to distinguish pagan Christians from true Christians, as both go to church together, praise the Lord, and call themselves Christians, the point of state. The difference, he added, is pagan Christians are too concerned with worldly desires and hopes and act, quote, act like enemies of the cross of Christ, Christians enemies of the cross of Christ, unquote. That was the article from the Jerusalem Post, and I will put that into the uh, chat box 
of our broadcast here. You can read it for yourself. And when I first read that, I thought, well, Pope Francis is coming out and declaring the Roman Catholic Church as pagan. That's the only sense it made to me at first. On the other hand, I thought, a little bit later, well, isn't this a great opportunity to diverse the so-called Roman Catholic Christians from real Bible-believing, Jesus Christ-following Christians? You make up your mind for yourself. But I'd like to hear a little comment from Tom on this article that I just read. Well, the question I have is, how can the pot call the kettle black? How can the woman who rides the scarlet-colored beast in Revelation chapter 17 judge God's people? How can the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, put himself out as the Christian of Christians, put himself out as in a position to judge the lukewarmness of Christians. And what is his purpose? It's simply to incite church participation and a drawing closer of people to the church. And what is the church according to the papacy? The Roman Catholic Church. And what is the church according to the papacy regarding the Protestants? They must come home to Mother Church. He's trying to generate fervency, religious fervency, to the Antichrist Church of the Bible, the synagogue of Satan. There's not a greater example of hypocrisy in all the world than the papacy setting itself up to be the judge of God's people. Now, I would agree in one count. Christians all over the world have lost their faith. They've lost their fervency. They are lukewarm. And Jesus said, that God would spew them out of their mouth. The scripture says that I would that you were either hot or cold, but since you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. But when we become religiously fervent, should we use the criticism and the judgments and the decrees of the Pope as the judge of our fervency, or should we use the scriptures? That's what this is all about. That's what this is all about. First of all, one makes a grievous error to regard the Roman Catholic Church as anything but pagan. If that sounds like an extraordinary statement, then explain to me how it is that the world still regards the Roman Catholic Church as a Christian church when its pope in 1983 called the religious leaders of every religious cult in the world to come to Assisi and to join with the Pope in common prayer. There were snake charmers that came to Assisi to help pray with Pope John Paul II. There was every kind of religious cult in the world united with the papacy, the king of the cults. And for him to judge the lukewarmness of Christians of any denomination is the height of hypocrisy. That's the reality. And we simply must get over this diabolical assertion that the Roman Catholic Church is a Christian church. What about all the pedophile priests? It's not just one here or there. It's in every country all around the world. Is this the sign? Is this the works? Is this the good works of a Christian church? 
How about the inquisitions, the killing, in the name of God, of Bible-believing Christians all throughout history right up to the present day? Is this the sign and the mark of a Christian church? How could anyone stretch their imagination far enough to consider the Roman Catholic Church to be anything but the synagogue of Satan literally defies reason. And they, yet they'll stand and silently listen to the Pope judge who is lukewarm. It's beyond comprehension that the world will tolerate one single word from this Pope or any other Pope. And it's simply testimony to the fact that there is no Protestantism left in the world. And if there is, they're silent. And there can no good come from the silence of God's people. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. The only kind of protest protest that is there today is, and I have to say that, in broadcasts like these ones that we are doing here. As Tom said already earlier, he will stand even when all the people in their black coats and black hats come knocking at his door and asking him to repent and come over to the Roman Catholic Church. He will stand there in the sure word of Jesus Christ and deny them. And so will I. Because as for Jesus the world that I want to live in is not of this world. And I can't wait for Jesus to wake me up at the resurrection and to invite me into his house where there is no lie, where there is no illness, where there is no deceit, where there are no shadows, but only light and truth and love. And this, in his power, and the power of Jesus Christ, that we do these broadcasts. Not only this broadcast today, all these broadcasts. They are not for us to get attention out there. I mean, of course, we would like to have that kind of attention that people follow us. Follow in the way that they learn from us to see what the world really is about. To see the deception they are living in. And then follow Jesus Christ and not us. Don't follow Tom. Don't follow Walt. Don't follow me. Follow Jesus. Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through him. You don't need Tom for that. You don't need Walt for that. You don't need me for that. But maybe we are in a position as of now to show you that that is the only way that you should walk. By this, I would start reading a little introduction into the Catholic Lutheran Accord. Dear friend, while apostasy is predicted in Scripture, it still comes as a shock to see it face to face. The apostasy seen with the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran World Federation on October 31st, 1999, regarding the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification, was called, quote, a milestone in Christian history, unquote. It was also known as the End of Reformation, along with, her other, uh, with other similar statements of acceptance. The Bible believer is to remember such was foretold, and he is to continue to contend for biblical faith. Through the Apostle Paul, the Lord Jesus Christ commands his disciples to, quote, stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, unquote. They are likewise commanded to, quote, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, unquote. The analysis given below is simple obedience to that biblical word. 
May I, may I request that you study the analysis and make it known far and wide and continue to stand strong in the precious love and truth of our all-sufficient Lord. In the Lord's loving kindness and grace, Richard Bennett. This was just the foreword to a document that contains about 13 pages that we will go through. Of course, not all of it today, but this broadcast and probably the following broadcast. Before we go further into the document, uh, Walt, is there something that you have to say to the things that have been said up to now, and do you have anything to add? Because, um, you know, you made a special page on that uh, article on the Jerusalem Post. Maybe you can even share that with our listeners for a moment. Walt? You're not listening? Okay. Then uh, I'm going to take the chance and I go back now and start reading the Catholic Luther in the court. A denier of the gospel and the righteousness of Christ. In the dialogue between evangelicals and the Roman Catholic Church, there have been alarming attempts in recent times to declare Roman Catholics as, quote, brothers and sisters in Christ, unquote. As we saw in the whole Evangelicals and Catholics Together movement. However, something more authoritative took place in 1999. The Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification, which is an official doctrinal statement jointly authored by representatives of the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran World Federation, was signed on October 31st as a joint confessional agreement. The importance of this event is clearly seen in the many comments on it, on it that imply that the Catholic Church has indeed changed and that the Vatican now accepts Reformation truths. Now, I just have to say something here. If you pay attention, it was twice mentioned here already that the signing of this so-called Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification or the Catholic Lutheran Accord took place on October 31st. Doesn't that date ring a bell? October 31st. Here in Europe, we call it Reformation Day. It even has been a holiday when I was a child because I grew up in Hamburg, northern Germany. In the, in the state of Prussia, exactly, because I was a little bit outside of Hamburg. So I grew up in Prussia, the old state of Prussia that doesn't exist anymore. But that stood for Protestantism all the time. October 31st, Reformation Day, is the night or the day that Martin Luther nailed his 95 Thesis to the church at Wittenberg. And I think, to quote what Tom said a little bit earlier, Martin Luther would not only turn in his grave if he knew what a denomination called the Lutherans, named after him, did on that very same day, some almost 500 years after he, on the danger of exposure and being killed, nailed the 95 Thesis to the Roman Catholic church door in Wittenberg, how they defied his name on that exact day, he would jump out of his grave and stone us. Tom? That's exactly the way I see it. October 31st should even to this day in America be regarded as Reformation Day. The day, officially, we were delivered from the Roman Pharaoh. That was our deliverance, October 31st, 1517. That began the Protestant Reformation, the coming out of her. It is a day equivalent to the day that God led the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage. 
The Lutheran Church is named after Martin Luther. Until recently, it held its, his doctrines and his beliefs that the papacy was the Antichrist, that the Roman Catholic Church was the synagogue of Satan. And here they are on that very day. Nearly 500 years later, using that very day to sign an agreement with the Roman Catholic Church. It's no coincidence at all that they chose October 31st. It's a spit in the face to Martin Luther by his own Lutheran church. It's an, an insult and an assault on our deliverance. It's, it's just the significance of this cannot be overstated. Rome is diabolical in her planning of such things. And that the Lutheran World Federation cooperated with it is beyond belief. Back to you, Yerk. Just to go back to the little reading that I did here, the importance of this event is clearly seen in the many comments on it that imply that the Catholic Church has indeed changed and that the Vatican now accepts Rome's Reformation truths. When we go now through this document, you will see that as in the beginning, like I have stated, Rome never changes. But the Protestants have to change in order to come back under the wings of the Roman Catholic Church, to unite into a one world religion. And the Protestants are the first part, and others will follow. Like, for example, Islam. Now you will maybe laugh in my face, well, Islam will never unite with Catholicism. Well, first of all, you have to know that the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, founded Islam. That they share the same beliefs. They are sun worshippers. They are idol worshippers. They hail Mary. And they love to bow down before idols. Both of them. They have so much in common. Roman Catholicism, uh, uh, Islam is actually nothing else than Roman Catholicism for Arabs. And when you study a little bit what a person called Rick Warren over there in the United States does already since years, he promotes Chrislam. Chrislam, the merger between Islam and Christianity. But of course, that means the Roman Catholic Christianity. Because a real Christian, a Bible-believing, Jesus-following person, will never go back under these rules. Okay. That was enough, I guess, for the introduction. I'm going to read, continuing in the document here. In the area of ecumenism, it has been said that, quote, the most significant development to date is the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification, published in 1999 and signed by the Vatican and the Lutheran World Federation. The document, with a jointly signed annex attached with offered genuine clarification to the Joint Declaration, I will abbreviate that JD uh, later on, included the acceptance by Rome of the Sola Fide Formula, in the joint declaration, it is affirmed that the doctrine of justification is the measure or touchstone for the Christian faith, an indispensable criterion. The JD specifically states that both Catholics and Lutherans jointly believe that whatever works in the justified precedes the follows or follows the free gift of faith is neither the basis of justification nor merit. It acknowledges that Lutherans hold the Reformation understanding of grace alone by faith alone, sola fide, and the imputed alien righteousness 
of God to the sinner, at the same time righteous and sinner, and most significantly, the JD explicitly states that the mutual condemnation of former times do not apply to the Catholic and Lutheran doctrines of justification. End quote. Yes, Tom. Yes, there is the reference I wish the listeners to pay particular attention to. It says, quote, the mutual condemnation of former times do not apply to the Catholic and Lutheran doctrines of justification, unquote. What Rome has just said is that those who sign this joint document will no longer be held to the anathemas of the Council of Trent. The 100 anathemas, or the 100 damnations of Protestantism. This is Rome's way of once more restating the threat of the Council of Trent. Okay? I don't want anybody to miss the somewhat circuitous language used by the Roman Catholic Church. I'll read it again, and you see for yourself, the condemnation that they're speaking of was the Council of Trent. So they're still using the Council of Trent as the standard. It says, and most significantly, the joint declaration explicitly states that, quote, the mutual condemnation of former times, that is the Council of Trent, do not apply to the Catholic and Lutheran doctrines of justification. In other words, if you sign this joint document, you won't be subject to the terror of the Council of Trent, the Counter-Reformation, the Inquisition that's coming to the world. If you sign this joint document, this joint declaration that the Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church have signed together, you'll be excluded from the Counter-Reformation. You'll be excluded from the Inquisition. Inherent in these very words is a promise that those who do not sign this document will be subject to the Counter-Reformation Council of Trent and the Inquisition, because the Council of Trent set a line in the sand. It set a, it sent a message that could not be misunderstood. If you believe the tenets of Protestantism, the doctrines of the Bible, with regard to faith and grace and justification, as is described in the Bible, then you are anathema. You are accursed. And, of course, that's just Rome's way of saying you are a heretic. And in the Third and Fourth Lateran Council, the Vatican was very careful to specify who a heretic was, and that is those who defied the decrees of the Council of Trent, in other words, every Protestant, and that it was not only not a sin to kill a Protestant or a heretic, but it was a meritorious work, which means you can receive more grace from God every time you kill a heretic. Now, people who are unaware of this history could read the language of this last, uh, the last portion that I just read and never understand its significance. And Rome counts on people being that ignorant of history. That's exactly why our history books never mention the Third and Fourth Lateran Council. Our history books never mention the Jesuit-led Counter-Reformation Council of Trent and that it was an open declaration of war for the annihilation of Protestantism and all Protestant beliefs and all Protestant institutions, including the Constitution of the United States. It is carefully crafted, the language in this joint declaration, so as not to awaken the Protestant sentiment But let me read it again 
so that there be no mistake in the listeners. It says, and most significantly, the joint document, the joint declaration explicitly states that, quote, the mutual condemnation of former times do not apply to the Catholic and Lutheran doctrines of justification. So if these signers of this joint declaration are no longer subject to the anathemas of the Council of Trent, by common sense we know that those who do not sign this joint declaration will be subject to the condemnations and the inquisitions and the tortures and the murders established by the Council of Trent and the Third and Fourth Lateran Accords, the Third and Fourth Lateran Council. And this is what needs to be taught from the Protestant churches to examine this language carefully in light of Roman Catholic history. I'm afraid too many people Almost everybody will read this statement and never comprehend what is really being said. And once one comprehends what is really being said here, the hair would stand on the back of your neck. I hope people, I hope I've explained this in such a way that people can really comprehend what is hidden in this seemingly benign language of this document. It's a declaration that those who do not sign this joint declaration are still subject to the anathemas of the Council of Trent and still subject to the Counter-Reformation, still subject to the Inquisition. Back to you, Yerk. Yes, Tom. Uh, thank you. I was almost uh, interfering with what you said because in the next paragraph uh, we will see all that confirmed what you just said, and I will even go deeper into that, referring to the video that I made last uh, last year in July about the Swanburne religion with the protest is over because Tony Palmer also says there's something that uh, makes a very good point. So I, <clears throat> I'm going to start reading uh, again. Uh, we'll repeat the last sentence because it is imperative to understand the next paragraph, and after the next paragraph we will go into a more explanation of this document, of course. And most significantly, the Joint Declaration explicitly states that the mutual condemnation of former times do not apply to the Catholic and Lutheran doctrines of justification. If this were indeed true, it would mean that the Catholic Church is now fundamentally changed in that it now accepts the very principles that made the Reformation. However, because we know that the Vatican continually claims that it is quote-unquote semper adam, unquote, means always the same, and that her Pope's teachings are, quote, irreformable by their very nature, unquote, we must analyze just what was jointly accepted on the 482nd anniversary of Martin Luther's pivotal posting of the 95 Thesis, what we will see is totally different than what many claim. In fact, the Lutherans of Lutheran World Federation have now embraced the doctrine of the Council of Trent, and in so doing have officially and formally denied the gospel and the righteousness of Christ. Significantly, of the three Lutheran synods in the United States of America, the Missouri Synod, counting 7 million members, the Wisconsin Synod, counting about 500,000 members, and Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, counting about 20 million members, only the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America signed this accord with Rome. End reading of this paragraph. Now, this brings me back to something that I quoted earlier in this video from uh, and, and the, 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 um, the speech that Tony Palmer gave at the meeting of uh, Kenneth Copeland Ministries. That is, 
1999, this was signed by the Lutheran Church, the Federation Worldwide. Later, five years later, the Worldwide Methodist signed the same agreement. But as of today, and there we are speaking, 2014, we still have had no Protestant evangelical that would stand up and sign this agreement to agree with our brothers and sisters that we are saved by grace through faith to good works. And I believe that is something that needs to be fixed. End quote. That was Tony Palmer in the video there. And that refers exactly to what I just read here and to the thing that Tom explained before. They are now taking up the borders and say who is under the wings of Rome and who is not under the wings of Rome. And if you believe to any congregation over there in the United States of America that did not sign the joint declaration as we read it here, then you will be the target for the Inquisition to come. Back to you, Tom. That's exactly right. Rome's playing her hand. It's an ultimatum. Everything that has come out of Vatican Council II and this ecumenical movement is simply an ultimatum. You either come back to Holy Mother Church or you're going to be destroyed, annihilated. The Jesuit-led Council, uh, Council of Trent, the Counter-Reformation, is going into overdrive. And Vatican Council II set the terms of an armistice. And if those terms are not accepted, if Rome's terms are not accepted, there is no armistice, and Rome intends to do what she always does, use the civil power to rout the heretics out of their realms. So there's a head count going on even as we speak. Who is intended to live and who is intended to die? You know, we hear in the, the foreign news media all about ethnic cleansings and uh, wars. They're nothing but terms to cover up what they really are, inquisitions. Rome has been conducting these inquisitions all over the, all over the world with the help of the United States. And so long as these inquisitions, these ethnic cleansings, these uprisings around the world happen in other countries, Americans just look askance and then go back to what they were doing. Never giving it a thought that God's people are being destroyed. But now the Inquisition is coming to the United States of America. Rome, through our government, is bringing this Inquisition to the United States of America. And now it's just a process of deciding who is going the way of ecumenism and who is going to die. That's as just as plain and simple as I can make it. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, I will now read the next two paragraphs that have on the title, and the title reads, The Elite, Untouchable, Joint Declaration. The Joint Declaration was the result of 30 years of Lutheran-Roman-Catholic dialogue. Well, that's from the end of Vatican II until 1999 about. This fact alone might dissuade many from daring to challenge it. The document itself is about 19 pages in length, depending on which printing one reads. Arrayed with many footnotes, a sizable appendix, the official response of the Lutheran World Federation, the Roman Catholic response, the clarifications to the document, and the added a countenance of John Paul II's comment on the Joint Declaration. 
The document appears very much like the rogues of those who devised it. All very haute couture, meant to stun anyone who might dare to analyze it. In addition to the first great showmanship with which the joint declaration has been presented, it appears that there is neither grub nor net that has not been strained out of his cleverly worded document and agenda. Dare anyone be so bold as to ask if a camel has been swallowed? Daunting circumstances, notwithstanding, the Christian committed to Scripture as his sole authority, and in the same Holy Spirit that gave the Scripture, is able to sift error from truth, discerning that which is in accord with Scripture and the official common statement in which the joint declaration is ratified and approved by both parties. Tom, you have a comment here? No, okay. not so far. Okay, then I will continue. But there are heretical landmines. There are presuppositions upheld in the joint declaration that are not stated as such in the official common statement. Some of these presuppositions totally negate biblical justification as, for example, the idea that justification is by means of the sacrament of baptism. Both parties of the agreement accept such a tradition of men. This is listed under the heading called 4.4, the justified as the sinner. The joint declaration states, We confess together that in baptism the Holy Spirit unites one with Christ, justifies and truly renews the person. This heresy is in line with the teaching of the Council of Trent. Yes, Tom. Yes, uh, I don't want the listeners to miss this. No, I- one, one, of the, one of the basics, one of the basic foundational principles of this joint declaration between the Lutheran World Federation and the Roman Catholic Church is the commonly held belief that salvation takes place at baptism. The Bible doesn't teach this. This is, as Richard Bennett describes it, a tradition of men. Now, the, 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 the Scripture commands us to be baptized, but it is believers' baptism. Every example of baptism in the Bible was only after an adult human being comprehended the gospel of Jesus Christ and then obediently was baptized to make a public declaration of his faith. It has nothing whatsoever to do with salvation. Salvation is by Jesus Christ alone. Baptism is simply an outward display of that salvation, of that decision to let Christ be your propitiation. It is a sign of your repentance. It is a a sign of your death, burial, and resurrection in Christ. It is never to be associated with salvation, which is the sole work of Jesus Christ himself. This is the biblical example of baptism. But Rome has always taught that that baptismal, a term that they use is called baptismal regeneration. In other words, your old sin nature is gone away The effects of original sin are gone away, and you become a member of the body of Christ when you are baptized, okay? Salvation by works. That's what Rome has always taught. Salvation by works. If you want to be saved, then you must be baptized. And after your baptism, you're saved. And this is exactly why Roman Catholics, when they have a new baby, The most important concern in their lives after that child is born is to get it to the priest in the church and have it baptized. Sorry to interrupt you here, Tom. Sorry. Yes. uh, That is a very important point that you make there because the Roman Catholic Church baptized infants as where the true Bible-believing Christian waits until the person is full-grown as Jesus was just baptized when he was 30 years old. 
That's right. And that is a very big distinction made between the two belief systems that, of course, is not written about here in this document. So please okay. continue, but I just wanted to put this in. All right. If I have adequately described the difference between uh, infant baptism or, or the, the doctrine of baptismal regeneration and believer's baptism, one be, the first one being the baptism of babies, as soon as you can get them there after birth to have them baptized, salvation by baptism, salvation by works, long before the child could comprehend anything about Jesus or the gospel. Look, look, if, if it's baptismal regeneration, an eight-day-old child is saved in the Roman Catholic Church when it is baptized knowing nothing about Christ, nothing about the gospel, nothing about his propitiation for our sins. The baby doesn't even know it's a sinner in need of salvation. So Christ doesn't even enter in to baptismal regeneration as practiced by the Roman Catholic Church. Jesus isn't even factored in the whole thing. Jesus is completely unnecessary. <clears throat> you see what a horror it is? But the Protestant belief is, as Jesus was, as Yerk just, just pointed out, Jesus was baptized at, the, uh, at about the 30 years old. And, of course, anyone who comprehends the gospel, comprehends how Christ paid for our sins, and believes in him by faith, then baptism is simply a sign of that. And that's why we call it believer's baptism. And every example in the Bible of a, of, of a baptism is of an adult human being after they've been preached the gospel, after God has convicted them sin, of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, after the Holy Spirit has witnessed to the marrow of their bones that it was Jesus who paid it all, and that by him and through him are we saved, and him alone. Then... Baptism is commanded, but not unto salvation. Baptism only comes after salvation. And so here we have this, this baptismal regeneration competing with the true teaching of the gospel. And don't forget the very basic foundation of this joint declaration presumes that you hold to the belief of Rome in baptismal regeneration. So right away, this de joint declaration is built on shifting sand. It's built on, a, on, a, on a, an error in doctrine. The whole thing crumbles before they ever lay the first layer of bricks. It's built on an anti-Christ doctrine. Because when, if, if indeed baptismal generation takes place, when an infant is baptized, knowing nothing of Christ, nothing of the gospel, then Jesus isn't even needed. That baptismal regeneration takes place completely apart. In Christ, and is that not what the synagogue of Satan is all about? And if Lutherans <clears throat> believe in baptismal regeneration, they too are of the synagogue of Satan. And no wonder that they should ecumenically reunite with their mother in Rome. It's a hideous reality. It, it's just very important that we understand why Protestants believe what they believe and judge what the Protestants believe with the Scriptures. And you'll find they are one and the same, and that Rome is a counterfeit and not even a very good one at that. And why anyone who calls himself a Christian or, or heaven forbid, a Protestant should sign any kind of documentation, a joint declaration with this abomination in Rome, 
it's unthinkable. Here's the lukewarmness of the Christians today. Here is the lukewarmness of the Christians today. They don't even know what baptism is all about. They call themselves Christians, and they don't know what Christianity even means. There's no fervency. There's no knowledge. There's no self-examination. And there's certainly no examination of the Scriptures. It's blindness. It's absolute blindness. And there's going to be a terrible price to pay for it. Back to you, Yerk. That with the baptism is a very interesting point. And I have to get a little bit personally on that. I have only been a Christian for the last three years, about. And before that, I was kind of an atheist, even though I was raised kind of Protestantist by my mother. But I had, when I was married, I had a son with my wife. She was brought up in Belgian Catholic. And my son was born in 1992. <clears throat> And my wife asked me at that time if we should go and baptize our child. And even though that I was not a Bible-believing Christian, I said, no, because I don't see any sense of baptizing him into the name of Christ when he cannot make the decision for himself as a child. So everything that I have done wrong by raising my child I have to admit, because I didn't raise him in a Christian way, because I wasn't a Christian, that at least I have done rightfully, and left him the chance to do it for himself. He today is 22 years old and still not baptized. So he can find his way to God and then make the decision for himself. And that is something I am the Lord very grateful for until the end that at least here I didn't make a capital mistake in raising my child. But enough of me. We are going to continue a little bit in this document. And um, the first thing that I'm reading right now comes from Henry Dessinger, The Sources of Catholic Dogma. And um, when you have the PDF document, and I will see that to you that later that you can get that later on, uh, and, and read along with it. I will put a link on the Word document that can be found on the Internet here, and then you can read it for yourself. Everything that he writes in here, when he quotes something, he gives, of course, the sources of that. And the source of this, I just told you, from Henry Dessinger, the sources of Catholic dogma. And that reads as follows, Canon 8, quote, If any shall say that by the set sacrament of the new law Grace is not conferred from the work which has been, which has been worked, ex opere operato, but that faith alone in the divine promise suffices, to, uh, suffices to, ob to obtain grace. Let him be anathema. End quote. Biblical truth, however, is that the believer's faith cannot be based on any physical works of men whatsoever, as true faith is in Christ Jesus' perfect life and sacrifice alone. To attempt to claim causative effects, therefore, for that which was given to testify to the Lord's grace and his finished work is to, quote, to preach another gospel, unquote. While such deadly landmines as this permeate the joint declaration, this analysis is limited mainly to examining, to examining the official common statement ratified by both parties. Is there something you have to add here, Tom? No. Continue. Okay. And I will continue the next, uh, <clears throat> the next few paragraphs, the next heading, and that will be the last for today because we have already gone for an hour and 40 minutes and I don't want to take it too long. But I will read the next four paragraphs and then we will make a break until the next one after we analyze this one. The Joint Declaration and the Judgment of the Sovereign God. Because God is, ho uh, is holy, is all holy, and man is dead in trespasses and sins, 
An immense gulf exists between the Creator and the human creature. Because of Adam's sin, mankind is born spiritually dead. God justifies his own holiness in graciously providing the believer's righteous, righteousness by imputing to the sinner the perfect righteousness of Christ and his perfect propitiation sacrifice. The scriptures proclaim the holiness and righteousness of God in the flawless life and death of the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Justification, in the first place, has to do with God himself, to show that he is just in justifying the sinner in Christ. The gospel has to do with who God is in his holy and righteous nature. The gospel demonstrates that because of who God is, he alone justifies. Thus, Romans 3, verse 26 states, quote, To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Unquote. The essential and final cause of justification is the glory of the divine holiness, justice, and goodness. Thus, the one who preaches any other gospel is accursed by God, as the apostle clearly stated in the first chapter of Galatians. It needs to be, I'm, so, I'm sorry, you're, no it, problem, needs, no it needs to be reiterated that when, when the Bible talks of justification, when men talk of justification, they're talking about salvation. That time in a man's life when in God's reckoning, a man becomes just, or rather, more correctly, God declares him just. That's justification. It's an act of God and God only. For only he is just. The Pope cannot declare you justified. Neither can your pastor, and neither can you yourself proclaim to be justified. It is only God who justifies because only he is just. And God tells us when we are justified by his just standard when we receive Christ as our propitiation. When we understand that Jesus bore on his body our sins. Not just a few of them, but every single one. He bore our sins on his body. He became sin for us. And he paid the ultimate price for our sins, every single one of them. And by that sacrifice, he reconciled us to God. And now God, the only one who is just, can look at the blood of his son. And every man, woman, and child throughout history who is washed in that blood, he can proclaim them just. Even though we are yet sinners. Christ's blood continually washes us. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is, even the sins that we've forgotten. Christ's blood is all efficacious. It covers all sin. And if we understand that plan of salvation, by his righteousness, by his justice, we can call ourselves justified. And do you know something? That infuriates the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of the Bible, the Pope of Rome. If we are going to be declared just, it is by through his methods that we are, that we are called just. That's because he opposes Christ. 
He opposes justice, justification. And that's why Rome seeks to destroy the Protestant notion, the Protestant belief, the biblical belief about justification, about, about salvation. So I hope I've, I've, uh, I've stated this in such a way that everybody can understand. We are just because only he is just, and only he is the justifier of the saints. No mention of the Pope, no mention of the priest, no mention of the pastor, no mention of the churches. And we are being judged by the Pope as to what we call justification. This is an encroachment upon the very authority of God himself. But that not that what we would expect the Antichrist to do, Yerk? Back to you. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, okay, I will read the last two paragraphs of uh, this part of the joint uh, of the Catholic Lutheran Accord from Richard Bennett here, and then we will round up the broadcast for today. Perversions of the gospel is an enormous crime against God. It debases the perfect righteousness and sacrifice of Christ, and in so doing stands against the very nature of God's holiness. Through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord warns, quote, But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Unquote. It must be carefully observed that it is not possible for those who pervert the gospel to continue unpunished, or for God to permit his glory to be set aside. The time frame is not known. However, the certainty is inevitable. God, who is holy, quote, shall be sanctified in righteousness, unquote. God is God. And those who teach a false gospel may not, by a false fancy, assure themselves of uninterrupted tranquility. God is holy by nature. He must be sanctified in judgment. For God cannot deny himself. This continues the reading of the Catholic Lutheran Accord paper by Richard Bennett for today. I will first ask uh, Walt and then Tom for some final statements, and then we're going to round this broadcast up for today, which I think was a very fine broadcast, but I go into that later with my closing remarks. Walt, please give us a little bit of your opinion of the things that we have been reiterated today. Well, it comes down to this. You know, we don't need a man. We don't bow our knees to any man. We bow to our Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, the more you look at this, you know, you you just, you know, the Antichrist is uh, hidden in plain sight. And anyway, that's uh, that's back to you, uh, York. Okay, thank you, Walt. And now, please, Tom, for some closing remarks on today's broadcast and an analysis of the probably last two paragraphs that I just read. Well, uh, I, I'm, you know, this is a wonderful work by Richard Bennett, explaining one of the great charades of the Roman Catholic Church. And it exposes the the, the apostasy of of uh, those signers of this joint declaration, and it is very important for God's people to know what is entailed in all this, and uh, it is a perversion of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a perversion or a repudiation of the Protestant Reformation and biblical Christianity. It is a step on the road to Rome, to idolatry, to the synagogue of Satan. The end game for all of these joint declarations and all of this ecumenical movement is a global religion. 
a religion that worships every god by every different name as long as everyone bends the knee to the pope. This ecumenical movement shouldn't deceive a child, yet it has deceived the whole world. But anyone who calls himself a Christian who is even vaguely familiar with the Scriptures can see we cannot be united with pagans. And the Pope dares to define what is pagan and what is not. The king of all pagans, the Pope, has set himself up as the judge of all men. And it's... uh, Well, you can't make this kind of thing up. It's just how the world can be deceived by it is just beyond comprehension. It's the greatest, most egregious assault on the throne of God that one can even imagine. And uh, if it's not repudiated, I'm here to tell you, if, if, if the Pope's Inquisition doesn't get you, God's wrath will. We've got to repudiate this, this ecumenical movement. We have to begin calling the Roman Catholic Church what the Reformers called it. We have to once again claim our deliverance from this beast in Rome. Because if we turn around and look back and wish to return to the Pharaoh in Rome, I'm afraid the earth will just open up and swallow us, just like it did the Israelites who turned aside and wished to return to Egypt. It's just that serious. That's all I have. Thanks, Jeff, for the invitation, and I'm glad and hopeful that we can continue uh, our reading of this joint declaration and uh, of this document by Richard Bennett. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you very much, Tom, for your contribution, and of course also, Walt, for setting the whole possibility up here, setting the website up and setting the call up. That was a very great help um, that we could continue to bring the word out now that we are not anymore on this uh, nothing but the call, nothing but the truth call on the other one, and we will have our own broadcast here right now. I thank my guests, Tom Press from Inquisition Update and Walt Stickle from Grand Design Exposed. Uh, for being here today. I want to thank the guests who have logged into the chat and listened to our live broadcast. And, of course, I will thank everybody in advance who will later listen and watch the video that I will be making out of this and the coming broadcast we are doing here. We will try to do these broadcasts on a regular basis, maybe once, maybe twice in a week. We will see how much time we can afford to put into this and when we can come together, because we always have to fight the time difference between Europe and America, where you guys are living. But um, I want to end this broadcast now with two quotes that um, everybody should know and should put into their hearts. The first one comes from the Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 12, page 496. And that is, quote, The supremacy of the Bible as source of faith is unhistorical, illogical, fatal to the virtue of faith, and destructive of unity. It is unhistorical. That is what the Roman Catholic Church says. And there is a Protestant writer by the name of J.A. Wiley who wrote a fantastic book that, if you do not know it, you surely should get, called Rome and civil liberty. And he states states on page 13 to 16, God alone is Lord of the conscience. That was the truth that set Europe free. And I add, he meant, of course, at the time of the Reformation. Now, God alone is the Lord of the conscience, and God's word is the Bible. 
and the Catholic Encyclopedia condemns the reading of the Bible and the Bible as a source of faith. Now make up your mind. Which one do you want to belong to? Do you want to belong to the kingdom of God and make God alone the Lord of your conscience? Or do you want to belong to the kingdom of the world and make the Pope Lord of your conscience? By this I will end the broadcast. Thank you very much for attending, for listening, and we hope to see you later. In the meantime, God bless you all. Have a good night. Bye-bye.